Thanks so much, Ruth, and welcome everybody. And thank you to Francis for taking part in this conversation. Just for anyone who's not seen the exhibition yet, a little bit of uh, cues to the, the kind of work that's in it, as Ruth said, it's really thinking about the relationship between art making, activism, and certain uh, kinds of social reality, I suppose, and the forms that might best convey them. So built around three films by Liz Rhodes, and in particular, the recent work, Ambiguous Journeys, which thinks about um, economic and political issues and uses both text and image to relay those very powerfully to the viewer. So that's installed in a, in a cinema style um, black box space within our gallery, um, running with another film called Dissonance and Disturbance. And then again, as Ruth mentioned, we've also got works, uh, moving image works by Anne-Marie Copestake, her film A Love from 2019, uh, photographic work by Imam Tajik, and also um, today's uh, guest in the Friday Focus, Francis McKee. And I think partly coming out of this practice of building the show around those roads, the work that we're showing is very much lens-based. And I think what we might talk around today has to do a lot with what happens when a camera enters into a social exchange, a particular socio-political situation. And the, the themes in, in this body of work by Francis really do center on acts of protest, of collective gathering um, and expression. And I, as uh, we'll, we'll explore, the, what happens when a sort of third term enters into the exchange between people who are gathering to make a point of view um, expressed in, in actions, in words, in images, and the, the police or other state actors who often, you know, whether you would say um, support that right to protest or harass it or limit it or circumscribe it in some way. So the camera and Francis as the, the photographer enters into that existing choreography and maybe makes something else happen. So you'll have seen from that previous image, there were quite a lot of works, um, photographic prints by Francis in the show, but they are a small sample of a much larger archive. We maybe touch on that as well. The, the protests that are covered range across quite a wide period of time, uh, a decade and more, and they cover a lot of different locations, Turkey, Palestine, uh, France, London, but also Glasgow. So there's a, a sense of the, the reach, the international reach of these acts of protest, and again, of the familiarity of some of the choreography there. But I wanted to start with a question, I suppose, about origins of this type of photography, Francis, about certain kind of street photography. And I know um, from hearing you speak about this over several years and, and talking to you, that the project initiated by an interesting trio um, Humphrey Jennings, Tom Harrison, and Charles Madge, the latter two pictured here, called Mass Observation, which continues in a, in a certain form today, but was really pioneered in the, the 1930s, start to 1937. To give you an idea of what uh, the kind of images they made, they, they would photograph what you'd think of as unprepossessing, unimportant things like children's graffiti or everyday life in a particular place. They started with a kind of study of Bolton. But Francis, could you? say what mass observation has meant for you and why maybe it sets a certain kind of precedent or cue for what you're doing when you take your camera into the street. Yeah, um, I kind of was fascinated by them initially because they were anthropologists as well and they went to Papua New Guinea, like everyone went to Papua New Guinea and they got there and then went, what the hell are we doing here? Um, you know, as they were examining people, <laughs> I'm thinking, this is racist, this is imperialist, it's dubious, it's not science, it's everything seemed wrong with it. So they came back and they went to Bolton. And I just love the fact that they decided, let's go to Bolton. <laughs> um, and they employed all the anthropological techniques, but to Bolton and turned the lens back uh, on the UK. Uh, there's still criticism that there was a class based and that they were much more, you know, kind of upper class, upper middle class, looking at a working class city. But I think within those contexts, they came up with all sorts of wonderful ideas. They paid people to take secret notes in bars to find out what people were talking about and at football matches. 
they ask people to submit their dreams and they, you can still submit your dreams. I think there's over a million dreams in the archive now. Um, and they started photographing what people might consider boring things. And particularly within the history of photography and American photog street photography, it's quite glamorous because America is quite glamorous. And it's exotic and there are beautiful cars and there's New York and you know, just take any photograph in New York City and it looks it's just amazing. But you take a photograph in Glasgow or Bolton, you really, <laughs> you're struggling. <laughs> it's a different concept. So Humphrey Spender, who was uh, their main photographer, really concentrated on taking the local, the ordinary, the banal, the everyday in the UK, which is much grimmer and you know, thrives on being grim. And there's a history of British photography, really street photography and British photography in general, Tony Ray Jones, other people, which is always concentrated on the ordinary and the almost the ugly or the provincial in the UK. And I thought, this, these are my people. <laughs> I, I love that walking down the street and spotting tiny things everywhere in the street, or I love kind of the things that are very maybe British or very kind of inexplicable and not exciting. Um, and so I started studying the history of British photography from mass observation onwards and finding ways to look at what isn't considered right for photography, the boring, uh, the everyday. So. And Francis, I suppose the, the larger photographic practice you have, it has many examples of that kind of study of everyday life, of things that you're finding in the street. But political protest, this is a, an image obviously chosen because it connects to politics but how did that as a, a theme emerge obviously protest is familiar but it's not quite every day um it's, it's uh, there's maybe a greater intensity sometimes to the moments that you've seen what was it that spurred the project of you know across this long span of time yeah. and in all these locations turning your camera to that i think there's there's probably a few things that all sort of come in like different strands <clears throat> one is i always wanted to, to make portraits um, but I don't really know enough people to make portraits. <laughs> so I thought if I go to protests, you're allowed to take photographs. There's a sort of pact with the, the population there that you can take photographs and people will even pose for you. And in a way you're taking a portrait, but as you said, the interesting thing is it's a much more intense situation and people are preoccupied. They're not thinking necessarily about themselves and how they look and it's not a biographical portrait, for instance. It's a portrait of people in duress or expressing something else and within a crowd. So for all those reasons, protests really began to work out and the, that dynamic of talking to people and getting permission in a funny way, at, in a split second, I really got into that. Um, it's not like you go up and you ask people, can you take a photograph? It's almost the worst photograph you can take. But it's almost just raising the camera or nodding at people and then nod back and you take the photograph and quite a lot of information has passed just in a few seconds to do that. And you have another role. You're not just there to take that photograph or to take a portrait. You find there are several other roles that you're performing while you're doing doing that at a protest. And with that in mind, um, oh. I brought along three uh, short quotes from this book, which I um, I know you're very interested in the work of Ariela Azoulay, who's an Israeli theorist, um, both of politics and of photography as a form. Yeah. And I uh, also, I mean, I really think this is, um, her work is is so germane to these ideas of a, like a larger practice of photography that goes beyond art photography, which is, I, I think maybe where you would situate what you're doing as well. But yeah. this idea, um, this is articulated in, in her 2008 book, The Civil Contract of Photography, that a photograph is really, before it's anything else, a record of a kind of encounter, um, just sort of building what you said before. I think what I, I see that in your images, I think for the reasons you just articulated that, that, that we're always aware of somebody addressing the camera. So yeah. whether that creates a sense of consent or of license, it always contains, it contains an acknowledgement of the, the different roles that are going on. So with an image like this, for example, you know, how, how did this um, how um, did this come about? And, and was it that kind of situation of, of a, a nod or 
was somebody w waiting for their photograph to be taken? <laughs> well, that was uh, COP26, and that's probably near Kelvin Grove Park, which is slightly blurry because it was absolutely torrential rain that day. But um, yeah, it, it brings up that issue of was he waiting? There's a compact or a contract, as Azule says, I'm there because I want to take photographs of the protest. The protester wants me to take photographs of the protest um, because there's no point protesting if people don't see it. The more people photograph it and distribute the photographs, the wider the message goes. So they want the photograph. The contract is kind of, they want a photograph that helps them get their message across. They will let you take the photograph and you have a kind of responsibility you're, you're witnessing to some degree, what they're doing, and you have a role as a witness. Uh, sometimes you have a role as a witness that stops the police from going too far. Your presence is also kind of important in preventing the police maybe doing things they would do otherwise. Not always, <laughs> um, but it, it is one part of it as well. Oh, they're coming for me now. I can hear the sirens. Um, <laughs> so, so there is that, and this, you know, this guy, clearly the way he's dressed, you know, he's coming out as a performance. I, I find this much more in Mexico, where I, I started a lot of my photography in Mexico, and um, there's a really a sense of street performance attached to photography there. Um, but at one point, I was taking a photograph of a hunger strike, and the striker was 88 days into a hunger strike and on an oxygen tank in a wheelchair at a press conference. And he suddenly slumped and had a heart attack. And I thought, this is, this is awful. And I thought this would be unethical to take a photograph. But everyone backed away from me and looked at me like, you know, OK, go for the photograph. And I realized that's, for their perspective, that's why I was there. I was there to take a photograph. If someone's having a heart attack in the middle of a protest, they want it photographed, the person having the, you know, uh, everyone, that's part of your reason for your presence. Otherwise, you're just uh, you know, overprivileged and present and useless. So you have a role to perform and you suddenly realize you're not in charge of that role. Um, mm -hmm. You have your own aesthetic decisions, but so do quite a few other people at the same time. Um, yeah, and that idea then, um, as they has so powerfully, I think that the both the photograph as a, an image, but also photography more generally, isn't somebody's sole right to author or own but it's no. part of this distribution of collaborative kind of moments that, that as yeah. we'll see also of course includes the police who, who are making images mm. in those situations they too are. but it's part of a larger transaction yeah and she says there's well, something that really struck me when i was reading her that it's you it's the subject you're making a contract to take the photograph but the other person present is the person that made the sensor in the camera or the film, if it's uh, using film. Uh, so the manufacturer is also present. And I always think of it with this photograph because it's the sensor just wasn't coping very well by that point in the day with the weather and the heat of the battery. And yeah. <laughs> so the, the manufacturer is definitely present in this photograph <laughs> as well. And so, so is the public. Yes. It's who sees it later? Who sees it further down the line 10 years from now, 20 years from now? There's a changing you know, uh, audience for the photograph. And obviously the police are also involved in this. The police yeah. go through protesters' photographs. Uh, they stream them online and go through them, filter, comb through them to find images of people that they want to put under suspicion. So you have to be careful mm -hmm. what and when you put up images. We'll, we'll touch a little bit um, later on about the, the archive, as I said, and your, your own archiving of these images but um there's something i think also sort of inherently multiple about them that they exist in our show as as this kind of cloud of images each one in a in a set of possible relationships to others and that's very clear in your decision to show them that way so they're they're not framed so they're they're presented in a i suppose a a less precious manner in various senses and they're shown so that you're never seeing a single image on its own it's always in relation 
Yeah. I was really struck looking at um, Azadeh's book again. I hadn't um, picked up for a while at this phrase because it felt it kind of came back to this issue in, in unraveling times somewhat unconsciously of, of these relationships between moving image and photographic image, which are there in Liz's work too. She's often stopping the film, thinking about what a single image means and then letting it run or having still images used as punctuation within them. I think it's there in, in Anne-Marie's work too and, and in Inman's. Um, but this idea that she has in this little um, passage that photographs aren't really things that we should look at, but things we should watch in the sense of a flow of time, of motion, of things at work. Um, it reminded me of quite a lot of your images. I picked this one, for example, uh. Yeah. from uh from istanbul but um oh, it's a thing that's should be in motion and isn't <laughs> but these uh these people have decided to be passengers in anyway but I, how do you feel france about that idea of some kind of shift i suppose from our, our mode of aesthetic reception of the still image and that what she's talking about as this social image is much more in motion yeah well that you picked a good image because uh partly what you're saying there what fascinated me with that bus was it was a burnt out bus in Taxim Square, but you can see people inhabiting it. They all, the, the women and men sitting, you know, just slightly to the right in the bus. Everyone is getting in the bus and sitting there like they were going somewhere. They were so pleased <laughs> sitting in a burnt out bus that could not go anywhere, but actually in their minds, the bus was going somewhere else. Like there's another motion happening there, which is the motion of Taxim Square and what was happening and the movement that was coming from those actions. So that's also there, but also for me, by coincidence, the sun coming through in that kind of burst of light from the sun is very 1969, uh, kind of American protest, countercultural type image. So that's a strand of time intersecting as well, photographic history mm -hmm. intersecting. So there's past history, there's the present history of Taxim and now there's the future history, given that the elections just happened last week. Mm -hmm. All of those things and the image, which I noticed with all photography, you can take the most boring image in the world. And in 10 years time, it's going to be fascinating because the fashions have changed. The building has been knocked down. That person you know, became prime minister. All of those things change. The, the image just keeps moving. It's not static at any point. And neither is the audience. People will look at an image and read it differently um, in different you know, contexts on a constant moving basis. So the image is never static in any way. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I take from Azale in that way. Mm, absolutely. So last um, point from her, but it's a kind of big one, this idea of, of the civil contract and a relationship between uh, all of these dynamics of looking being seen, um, yeah. addressing a camera and so on. And she makes this claim, and again, it kind of came to mind in this context because of Liz Rhodes' interest and Iman's interest in citizenship and statelessness as political uh, categories. But she says here, and she's thinking about photographs taken in, in Israel and in Palestine in particular, mm -hmm. but obviously with wider repercussions, that, that even a stateless person is a citizen when photographed, a member of the citizenry of photography. And yeah. citizenship and who gets to occupy public space and what terms seems like it's just a, uh, inherent to these uh, kinds of situations you're uh, often photographing, Francis. So there's there were attempts to kind of enact the democratic space, yeah. you know, sometimes in very uh, circumscribed situations or temporary situations. And there's also the the countervailing image of citizenship as something that's um, as they says, I think really uh, brilliantly, that that what brings us together as a citizenry is that we are governed. You know, so yeah. whether one is formally a citizen or not, you're subject to power through uh, government. And government, the, the choreography that Ruth alluded to earlier is is the choreography between uh, the state and these inactions of a democratic impulse, often to progressive yeah. change in your images. So. Could you say a little bit about that, about the, the managing, I suppose, looking at the these different sides, because they're they're often co-present in your images. Yeah, and they're also, yeah, everybody is involved in them. There's 
going back to the witnessing, that you've got that rule of witnessing and the citizen, notion of the citizen, it's almost down to sort of the simple thing of saying uh, someone has been seen or someone felt is feels they have been seen when they're photographed. The fact that going back to even to mass observation, the fact that you stop at something that seems insignificant and take a photograph of it, elevates it in a, in a way that a photographer like William Eggleston would say is democratic. The fire pump is just as important as the Coke bottle, which is just as important as the woman walking down the street. There's a democratic, everything is important. And if you photograph people in a protest, they feel seen. Um, and ironically, given that we're on this photograph, even the police <laughs> feel that. <laughs> and will quite often either, you know, want to chase you and beat you up or feel seen and some remarkably kind of pleased that they have been seen. And in that photograph, I have others later, that particular group of policemen suddenly were confronted by a group of protesters who had decided to dress in the same way for their own protection, <laughs> with, with jackets, with uh, helmets, uh, with shields and cameras, and were filming them. And the strangest thing was you could see the police kind of admired them. <laughs> they kind of thought, that's pretty cool. Now we're going to get you, but that's really cool. <laughs> Um, and the other side of the police, uh, on the very left behind them, there's a series of older people who came from 1968, who are older protesters, who are almost commentating on the protest as if it was a cricket match, and kind of going, oh, that's a good move, oh, look at that. And there was this whole series of kind of views all happening at the same time. Um, but I think everyone then is concerned within that about what it means to be a citizen and who controls everything. and. And the photographer clearly plays a role in how they frame it. It's one thing that your images um, are clearly not, are the kind of images that run on the front pages of newspapers when protests happen. So they're not no. the decisive moment of a bloodied uh, protester no. or uh, the, the, mo the, the wittiest banner at the protest mm. or anything like that. And I wondered, I mean, obviously you're shooting more images than necessarily make it into, say, the presentation in an exhibition. Mm -hmm. But what are those moments? I mean, uh, protests often take place over long periods of time when not a lot happens, mm -hmm. and you yeah. seem drawn to those more every day, <laughs> moments, I, um, right, than the, than the drama. Yeah, I remember actually being kettled um, just south of the river. There was a protest near Tramway. Um, and people were jumping up in the cars and they kettled everyone and I was in the kettle and um, three hours. And that was wonderful because no one was doing anything. But I remember one woman who just kept walking around reading a book and she looked like a refugee from that film um, uh, where they burn books. And she just kept walking around, walking around, reading the book. And it's, it's those kind of moments that aren't the big dramatic moments for the front pages of newspapers. And most of those are choreographed extremely. And you see there are photographs of people stepping back to take photographs of the people setting up the scene to make the newspaper dramatic photograph. Um, and I just, don't, I just don't like, they feel false to me, but it's the everydayness of the protest and the sheer commitment to the boredom. Protests are incredibly boring. Uh, <laughs> people walk forever <laughs> and uh, do think you know and it's there's a lot of it is just not exciting until these guys get into action and then there's a few moments but that's almost a cliche it's more the sort of commitment of people the quiet uh dull commitment in the rain to go out and uh be photographed and to go on the walk for two hours and to stand there and listen to the speeches that's that's what I like, that kind of camaraderie. And there's so many interesting things going on in the background often of these images, like the guy on the phone and the person coming out of the shop and so on. And they, they do really yeah. evoke that fact that this is happening in a, nor in a normal social space. And um, yeah. I've got one more image, Francis, which is oh. one that you suggested. Yeah. Um, it's not one from the exhibition, but it, it opens onto this question, I suppose, of archives and how they function. And yeah. um, maybe you could tell us what this image is, first of mm. all, and then we can take it from there. Yeah, well, I'm interested in archives. I've always had a long term interest and we've made an archive at CCA where I work. But um, 
also someone came from Prague and said we would like to make an archive based on the kind of model you've set up. Very fast, a fast and dirty archive, basically a guerrilla archive using you know spreadsheets from Microsoft, etc. Um, and this was the archive of a woman called Esther Krombachova, who was a very famous filmmaker and screenwriter and costume designer in the 60s. And she was involved in a film called The Party and Its Guests, 1966, which really was a metaphor or allegory of the Communist Party uh, and its oppressiveness in Czechoslovakia. And she researched them in great detail, all of the key figures in the secret police. The film came out and was banned immediately and remained banned till about 1974. Her husband, who directed the film, was forced to leave the country. They divorced. She decided to stay, but they banned her for 20 years. So she couldn't work from 1970 to 1991. No one was allowed to work with her. She wasn't allowed to be part of anything. And so she retreated to her flat. And in 2016, someone came forward with all of the contents of her flat. After she died in 1996, the flat was kept intact. And this was the archive. But this in particular, she did three things when she was in her flat for 20 years. She wrote letters that she never sent, but tore up and kept. Uh, she wrote very evil fairy stories and she made magic amulets <laughs> and practiced a kind of, you know, as a witch, in a sense. Um, so this is a photograph of students um, from programs in the Prague Art School uh, and myself trying to reassemble the letters to see what were the letters that she didn't send and to translate them and to figure out who were they to, what did they say, why weren't they sent. Um, and it's in an exhibition which is about the similarities of archive procedures and techniques and uh, their similarity to the techniques of the police and surveillance as well. So, so I've just actually contacted the secret police archive in Prague and they have sent me her file, um, the entire file, 225 pages of her being you know, tailed every day from 1957 uh, to her death. Um, so it's really, but I photographed everything in the archive and I'm kind of interested in the photographs of the archive, her interest in the secret police, the secret police's interest in her. And from a biographical point of view, how the surveillance actually becomes biographical information later. And I did a talk on this in Egypt and the secret police turned up to record the talk. <laughs> And a secret policeman turned up with a suitcase with a microphone and tape recorder and a thing in his ear that connected to the suitcase. And um, he sat throughout the entire talk and I talked about how the secret police, by accident in a sense, are creating biographical archives that can be used now because there's such detail. If you imagine having someone tailing you for 20 years and they've got a record of what you wore every day, where you went, what you ate, who you spoke to, what you did in the evening. It's almost like a Proustian kind of mind-blowing experience. No, I wish someone was doing that for me in, in a funny way. And actually coming from Northern Ireland, someone did. <laughs> I come from South Armagh where there's lots of watchtowers and we were being recorded constantly. And my mother who's a solicitor was constantly being interrupted on the phone. Uh, by listeners um, who would say, do not continue that conversation. So that that sort of overlap of surveillance mm -hmm. and photography is something I'm also interested in. And this is going to be in the upcoming exhibition in Berlin, Mick Francis? It is. I'm making what's called a crazy wall with those walls that detectives have with all the lines going from one thing to the other. And I'm making an archive of the photographs uh, on a table in front, an archive table, so people can uh, go through. It's within an archive film festival. So. And I mean, I, one of the things that your photographs uh, do when I look at them is is document how you've been spending your <laughs> your, your time. And they, they, the volume, yeah. I think we, I mentioned it earlier, but we, we made a very small selection that, that indicates, and I think it's sort of palpable in the exhibition, that they, they come from a 
a plethora of material, but you you have sort of been producing a really substantial photographic archive. Yeah. Are you interested in it? You know, I suppose that um, that excessive quality that in order to sort of take the measure of these things, one needs more than is manageable in some way. Like I feel, I, yeah. I implicitly feel that your archive might not be manageable. <laughs> right? not my, sure. my flat isn't manageable. Yeah. But yes, I, I almost went down the rabbit hole last year and started a research project on, there's a few American street photographers and there's a guy called Eugene Smith. And Eugene Smith was sent to Pittsburgh by Newsweek, I think, to photograph for two weeks, come back with 100 photographs of industry in Pittsburgh. He came back two years later with 4,000 photographs. <laughs> and again, my people, you know, <laughs> And there's another photographer uh, who died, a uh, street photographer, and after he died, they found dustbins full of unprocessed uh, films, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rolls of film in each dustbin that are still being worked through and being processed now. And it's that th this one particular photographer got so obsessed, he almost just had to photograph everything. And there is that, I'm really interested in that tendency that things are out there, reality. And if you photograph one thing, but you don't photograph the next, what happens to the thing in between? And that, you know, overwhelming obsessiveness, which is a kind of sickness to want to photograph everything. And even then you realize you're just one person in one particular part of the street. So how could you fill the entire you know, street with photographers? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's a terrible nightmare. <laughs>